Hey guys, BBI here. I want to stop and say thanks. Thanks for tuning in and checking out whatever the video is about that's about ready to come up next. If you could take a minute and hit subscribe, I'd greatly appreciate it. And if you enjoy what you've seen here, make sure to hit the like button. We'd greatly appreciate your support. Anyhow, guys, all that aside, let's get on with the show. Here we are once again to do this dangerous deed to which all you all have become so accustomed. Listen, if this is your first time watching, I want to take this opportunity to say welcome. Take a minute, click subscribe. You'll enjoy it. We're always doing crazy shit like this. If you are a repeat offender, <laughs> I say welcome back and I thank you. Appreciate your support. So what we're here to do today is to take a look at Mr. E's uh, blue label. Uh, yet again, not, not yet. Look, check this out. Yet another X Force. Happens, happens. Check it out, man! It showed up with the 220 plug. I don't have to change. Whoop whoop! It's the small things you have to find pleasure in. I gotta tell you, as I'm taking the case off, I'm gonna tell you, I'm really excited. I went and bought a new bed today. Ha! Huh. I have been feeling horrible the last couple months. Waking up every morning with a headache. And I come out here and I'm like, oh, I gotta go back to the grind. I created this monster to which I live in. And, uh,. <laughs> When you wake up starting your day off with a headache because of your bed every day for a couple months and you don't sleep well, it really starts to take a toll on you as a human being, I'm here to tell you. So, oh, that's no good. That pim nut's gone. We decided today that we were just going to go buy a new bed. I looked at my, my beautiful better half. My, come on, keep, keep, oh, you're going to be that kind of girl, aren't you? Yes, you are. We're going to have to torque live the cabinet. I looked at my better half, my existence for living. The whole reason that I actually even get to be here is because of her. Because she's willing to do everything in the back end to help support this craziness we call my job. Don't stick to my shoe like toilet paper. Knock it off, bag craziness I call my job. She's the one that keeps me reeled in and uh, keeps me on task most of the time. So I looked at her this morning and I said, baby, I don't know about you, but I feel beat down. And she's like, ah, oh, we just woke up. And I was like, I know. I feel like I just went to sleep. So we jumped off the ship. We went and we, uh, we went and got ourselves a purple. And uh, me being a bigger boy, I had to get the, uh, the biggest one they make because, well, I've already got a very large bed. Oh, oh boy. The capacitors of doom. Come on. Come on. Come. Oh. Okay, so what has happened here is when they put the screw in, they side loaded the screw and it kind of went in sloppy cockeye wally angered. It went blink. So the pim nut, the, the cabinet folds over and the pim nut, this back pin nut here, is cross-threaded on the screw plus it's been pushed in so it's no longer grabbing the cabinet man this is never fun come on come on come daddy don't make me get me at evil 
I'll get the Dremel out on your ass. It's not happening. Okay. I'll take you in the back room and have another kind of conversation with you. Give me just a minute. We're, we're going to give this pim nut an attitude adjustment. See what I mean? It's the part that was hanging out through the cabinet, this top part. And it got cross-threaded and somebody got overzealous with their screw gun and proceeded to knock it clean out of the out of the, the hole insert. Okay. We'll throw that in the trash because it's now worthless. We'll throw its company head in the trash because it's now also worthless. So what do we have? We have a two drive in two, four, six, eight, ten. So we have a 12 pill. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Barely. Barely enough. This is one of the ones that we got to be very careful with. Um, I don't know if you all remember the, the heat sink that I removed from one of these one time that was only about yay wide. It really needs to be about this wide. That was a flipping nightmare. But I'm looking down in there and I can see the heat sink stock goes from here to here. So we're good. Cool. Um, he said it just doesn't work right. And he constantly had problems with it melting down and burning up and him having all kinds of heating issues with it. And um, it never quite put out the power it should. Of course, this has got the PPXHs in it, 15XH, which we all know from the last two Vigeos I put out, there are no replacement components for these. And we don't know what they really are. So hopefully it's just a tuning issue and we don't have to repill the whole thing because that would suck. Money-wise and every other which way. Let me turn this so you get a little bit better view at it. These are straight from Alibaba, these big discs. And this is direct re result of not having the proper parts available. For years, we were able to land our, made by uh, Simcoe, an American company. Shoot, that one's not even soldered on all the way. Um, we had the metal clads that we were able to purchase and they were really super cheap. And then it got more and more and more expensive and then guess what, they ran out. If it wasn't for companies like Fatboy that were willing to put up the huge financial um, amount of money for us to be able to get these parts made as replacements, um, majority of y'all would be screwed and you'd all be doing this kind of thing. When they ran out, he wasn't able to get them either. Arland over at X-Force, he wasn't able to get them either. So he went searching for a cheaper, uh, more plentiful, viable option. And we've seen him try everything from SMAs to, <sighs> this is one of the options he built probably five, 600 boxes like this. If you have these caps inside your amp, you need to have them replaced. Uh, me and Carl and Tony and everybody else in the amp building business has come out and very publicly at this point said that this is a substandard form of construction, these caps. These caps have a tendency to just vary all over the place as far as value. So, I mean, you're talking three, four hundred puff difference between A and B transformer. Like, this is supposed to be roughly a thousand. We measure it, it might be 1400. And then this one's going to be 11. And then this one will be 18. And when they get hot and they start to fail, hence the reason that he started doing this thing where he was spacing them out like this. The whole idea behind that is to get more airflow across all the capacitors and pray for the best, that they won't break down. And me, on the other hand, um, I partnered with my friend. Zane at Big Rig Radio and we went out and proceeded to buy every metal clad capacitor we could find on the face of this earth. We ended up buying them all from a guy in Canada and he was selling them to us by the pound. And I mean, we're talking hundreds of pounds worth of metal clads that we bought. And uh, from that, we've created a whole bunch of 1% uh, 
um, double KVA rated, so like 15 KVA or more uh, rated metal clads that we'll replace all of these with. I see that right out the hop. I don't see any 10 ohm smoke indicators, and I say that tongue in cheek. Don't see any burn up 10 ohm resistors. Usually these output caps that are 150s, these are way too small of a KVA that are in here. They have a tendency to get hot and break down as well. Hmm. I want to run it first and see what we have for performance, see if it's a power supply issue or see if we have a transistor that's failed, but this has all got to get upgraded. These have all got to get changed. These caps back here all have to get replaced at a minimum for it to leave here and for me to feel morally and mentally safe about it. So let's bust out the FLIR, let's get the workbench set up and let's start. So we're going to start here. Let's go over here and get our units of measure out of the way. 1000 watt slug in peak, 1000 in average, 5 watt slug in reverse from the bird 10,000 watt dummy load of course. We've got our fluke 73 and we got it tied in down here on the board and over here on the case. Now, did have a small problem. I noticed that the on off switch here is busted. That's okay, I can fix that. It's currently in the on position. That's not a big deal. Um, did have a small problem when I first clicked this on, it didn't do anything. So I might need to visit this curling breaker, but we've got this all set up now. It's idling at 14.2 volts, 14.25. Out. Now, this coax is indestructible, but man, has it got a hell of a memory to it, I'm here to tell you. Okay. I just have a feeling I'm going to need my FLIR. Let's, uh, let's shut the amp off for a minute. And let's go around all of this. I've got the Stryker 955 hooked up. Hello, adio. We're down on 12 volts, so we're doing hello, audio, about 60 watts, 50, 60 watts. I don't want to push it. Uh, let's see, where do I got the dial a peak on this son of a gun? Dial a peaks all the way up. Input powers at a quarter, my gain's up, but then I have the bird all the way down. I just have a feeling. I just have a feeling. Sorry, my phone keeps going off. Hello, audio. So let's go ahead, we'll turn on the amp. So 50 watts of drive. Hello, audio. Hello, audio. What's our power supply doing? Just the dead key alone is making it drop to 13.6. Hello. So 50 watts of drive. It's dropping down to less than 13.2. And we're making, in peak power numbers now, let's take this up to 2x. Hello. 1200 watts of power. So let's move over here. Let's go see what we have for driver transistors. Okay, so two PP100s driving 10 PP100s. Now on the front of the box, there's some new labeling I've never seen before. And that says, this unit is calibrated for 27.685 megahertz. Radio output power should be set at Maximum power input slash drive power into amp, 10 watt dead key, AM, and 125 to 150 watts PEP, AM, and sideband. This is new to me. I've never seen this before. Well, I don't think I can get my striker to dead key that high. But, let's try. Let's, uh, let's start off over here. 
we'll use the five watt slug. We'll click it around so it's in forward. We're going to look at this this meter here. So there's five watts. There's five watts. Should be about 10, fully chooched out, I think. It's real close. It's like maybe eight watts. Let's see what eight watts worth of input carrier does. We put the peak meter back on to 1x. That's a 400 watt dead key. Hmm. We're sitting at focus, 13.49. Hello, hello, and it's barely making over a thousand watts. Hello. You can only imagine what would happen if we went to 10 watts worth of power. Well, let's see what's getting hot and what's not. We're going to save that picture. And what I'm seeing is this resistor is getting hot. Oh, sorry. 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 Left you all behind. I'm sitting over here probing stuff and looking at stuff. It's too tight. It's not going to focus. This one resistor in the back is getting hotter than the others. So let me click over to that, that picture real quick. And you guys can clearly see the resistor in the back is significantly hotter than the rest. Let's click back over to the big camera. So we don't know where that imbalance is coming from, which is caused on this port. This resistor is getting hot, but it's on this port. And we don't know if it's the imbalance in these caps, an imbalance in one of the output capacitors. I did notice that these are 300s. These should be 330s here on the inputs. There's a couple different things that we want to change. We want to work our way through. So, um, the other thing is we want to change our voltage on our power supply. This is, this is horrible. Um, we don't technically have enough supply. There's, what, 250, 260 amps worth of power supply in here technically. Um, we know that eight transistors pulls 200 amps. So, we're looking at an additional 300 amp, another 100 amps, so roughly around 300 amps fully chotched out on sideband. This thing will consume 300 amps. Um, we're stretching it. You're praying to Jesus and the Holy Ghost by thinking that these little switch modules are going to be able to keep up with that on a continuous basis. So I don't know. He'd be better off if he dropped the driver section out of this amp completely and then had an external two-pill driver. But it'd be also less heat to try and dissipate on a one row of heat sink. Now, this is a common addressed issue, something that we've discussed many times about how this, for some odd reason, just this whole stomp pattern happens to be, by some miracle, if they went with just slightly a smaller hole or even slightly a bigger hole, we would have almost double the amount of airflow. There's, there's literally no air movement going on here. And I've, I've yet to come to a good way to show that. I've got a windometer station here. <sighs> I mean, there's right now there's 4.6 CFMs worth of air coming out of 220 CFM fans. So I wish there was a cooler, maybe there is a cooler way here. No, it's just going to come out like haze. I'm trying to think maybe I can shoot some vape smoke into it, but there's no draw. Okay, there's no air circulation. And now, we know that it's a heating issue, and I was told that this thing's already been back to X-Force once. They stuffed a new hole in the lid, and this is probably what's doing 90% of the cooling of the box is this one fan. Um, they had to go and center the fan the way they did. In such a place to where we can't put another fan in the lid. What I've done in the past to help overcome this issue is we take out these back two supplies 
which is probably what we're going to end up having to do here. We take out these back two supplies and drill a hole right in the middle. I take my 120 millimeter punch and we knock these out and then we just put standard fan guards back here. It does make it a little bit louder, but instead of having 12 CFMs of airflow, or pardon me, 4.7 CFMs worth of airflow, you can get all the way up to full 20 out of it. If we can get 40 CFM worth of air to move through the cabinet, 40 to 50 CFM worth of airflow, that's usually enough to keep this, this thing cool. Um, there's a couple little guards, grill vents back here I want to block off. There's one back here in a the corner. There's another one directly underneath the relay that does absolutely shit. And then, it's such a challenge. But I, I build a piece of phenolic that goes and it actually channels the air directly out. So all the air has to go down and across the heat sink and out. That has a tendency to help. But our biggest shortcoming is our power supply, which is definitely not big enough by 30 amps. And we've shown over and over and over on video that these supplies really, um, the guys claim they're good for 30, 30 max, um, continuous everyday operation. We want to see maybe 20 on each one of these. So. Ah, uh, next bit's to rip it all apart, and I get to contact the customer. So when we return, I'll have talked to the customer, I'll figure it out a game plan, and I'll bring you guys all up to speed. Okay, let's do a very simple test. So I removed all these caps, and I keep hitting on this every chance I get, because I, I am fully aware that not every single one of you guys watches everything I do. I mean, you don't have 17,000 plus YouTube subscribers and only average about 3,000 views per video. And a hot video is only 4,000, so that means I'm only reaching like an eighth of my demographic every single time I come out here to preach. So I have to cover this in every video. And I, I'm, I apologize for the repetition that you guys will watch, this, watch me all the time. This one is 897.5. So 897.5 PF. All right. Put that one there. Let's see how far off now. That's like 15% uh, tolerance and gap. This one is a 901.0. And remember, our goal is 1000 PF. Okay? I love doing this kind of actual real data collection and science. Got a loose connection. Stabilize. 883.3 puff. This is a non-opinion based, so this isn't like, oh, my opinion is these parts work better. Or my opinion is these parts are substandard. This is something that is a non-opinion base. This is something that I can throw up in front of my peers and have them review and go, oh, oh yeah, you can't argue with that shit. You just can't. So this is 873, 873.4. Remember, our goal is to put a thousand puff in that portion of the circuit. Yes, it's time consuming to do this over and over and over again, but you don't know how often I get asked, so why don't you shoot a video on that? Well, I have. And then they immediately follow it up, well, where's the link? <laughs> Man, Google it. Come on, your fingers ain't broken. You could have Googled it quicker than you could have typed the response. Okay, so 896.6. And remember, this is us sitting in a room that's about 
67 degrees. So this is 874.8. These parts are not hot. So here's our data set. This is an unarguable data point. Now, if we wanted to, we could do an average number, but it doesn't matter. Our goal is a thousand puff. So this is our one that's the closest, 901. It is what it is. This is our lowest. That's a lot of capacitance difference, even between these two, even though we're wildly short of this number. Now, according to the Chinesium data tag, these are QRC430J, 20 something can't read it, 2 kV a piece, P3s. Here. Four hundred and thirty. So even individually, they're off. If we were to measure these individually, they should roughly read four hundred and thirty puffs a piece. So a grand total of eight hundred and sixty is what we should see from these, according to the part print from China. So it's the same problem I have the straight from Alibaba blue components that I have with these. Now let's do some passive simulation. Okay. Let's put a little warm air into the equation. We're just going to blow some warm air on these, just like they're in the box running. I'm not going to get too overly carried away. Now let's see how quickly they recover. So we just took 75 puff roughly, 70 puff roughly out of these components. Please note they're so cool I can handle them with my bare hands. But look at how wild that is fluctuating. Now we're going to let that slowly count up because as the cap cools off its tolerances are going to change. Now let's go over here and grab something that's metally bonded. Okay. See, I heated those caps up to be 111 degrees. 120 degrees at the hottest point. 130 degrees at the hottest point. Still hot, not hot enough to actually cause any damage to you. But look at how far that cap fell out of tolerance just with that 50 or 60 degree of air temperature change. Slide this up out of our workspace. These are the caps that I like to use. These are metal clad. Actual real made in America components. Yes, they cost a little bit more. But remember our goal is 1,000 puff. So that's 1,006, which is way different than the 225 puff difference on these components and a hundred puff. So let's just put this on high. Here, let's get it hot. It's so hot the parts are smoking. The actual rubber booties on the capacitance meters are melting. Passes leads. It's come up 10 puff. 144, 150, somewhere near. That's hot enough to actually burn my fingers. But I think you guys can see the value in using actual real bona fide American made components. This test is the one that makes everybody go, hmm. This is open for variation of judgment. You can you can sit there and call, oh, this is a, a smoke and mirrors test because 
you don't really know how hot I'm getting the metal. This is going to give us a false reading because it's got a shiny surface on it, so therefore the infrared thermometer that's based into this unit is going to, is going to fib to us. This static test is enough to disqualify this component as being something that's safe to use. This heat test, that's open for interpretation, but it's obvious, completely obvious, to any and everybody that ever can see the video, that this is the better route to go on. It really is. Is this the highest end capacitance meter that you can possibly spend money on? So is that open for interpretation? Sure, it's not really. I've had, what, two dozen that I've used over the years and they all read within a two or three percent range. For the cost point of this meter, it is surprisingly how accurate it is in all the different functions. I use it just as a capacitance meter, but it does all kinds of stuff. This is a 1% part. These are all 1% parts. And at eight, nine dollars a part, a little bit of money in that bag. Just saying, it's food for thought. If your amp has got these kind of caps in it, these need to be replaced with something that is actually, well, worthy enough to do the job. Because these cold static numbers, they can't be argued with. They can't. They just can't. So I'm moseying right along in the, the, the teardown process here and I'm pulling out input power wires because you know me, I like to get rid of this bottleneck that's in the box. And I come down here to the driver's section, I'm like, wait a minute move these wires out of the way. As you guys can all clearly see here, the driver section is going to ground. I'm like, well, wait a minute, how does that work? Let's go back to our test section of the video. He'd be way better off if he would just drop the driver section out and run this thing as a regular back to reality. This coax over here comes directly off the input side of the relay, crosses over to box, and comes out here. Let's see if I can get in there and grab it. Anyhow, it comes and crosses over, and this is it, this piece of coax here. It goes directly into the input network splitter for the final stage, which is these 10 transistors here. This whole two-pill section in here has been bypassed this little hibby-jibby garbage here, which, okay, um, we're not going to get into how that's not the proper way to set up an attenuator, but um, this whole driver section has already been dead. So our voltage results that we've seen with our test is just with the final stage running, which is a bad sign. So now what I got to do, now that I see this, is one, correct myself publicly in video land, which I'm doing right now, and then two, that tells me with that significant, even with only 50 watts of drive, our voltage on the power supply is dropping down to 13.3 or 4 or 5 or something like that. We got problems here. It tells me that I bet you one or more of these units has gone tits. No longer any good. It's broken. It's got problems with it. Has let the magic pixie smoke out. Or is not connected properly. So. Now what happens is all of these get to come out in one homogeneous unit and I get to slowly disconnect each one of these, preferably the power pole is how I like to do it, and individually probe them. You cannot rely on just the LED indicator to tell us if there's a problem or not um, because if one goes bad it's going to use the LED, the LED is actually driven by the output voltage, but when you take the output voltage and you pair it in parallel with a bunch of other power supplies, that voltage is present drives that LED, so it doesn't tell us anything. So I'll lift that positive leg and then I gotta run each one of the power supplies and make sure they're actually putting it out. If they are all still working, then I've gotta go over here and this, this bundle of wires, what this is is our control voltages that go to each one of the, the units and down underneath the board here, down here 
is a set of resistors. There's a resistor here and another one here and another one here and it actually loops over and it ties to the, the board here so it loops around and comes to the board. This resistance is too high and so we're not able to appropriately push the voltage high enough to be able to compensate for the voltage sag which inevitably is going to be like a volt or two. A volt. So we might need to adjust that but first I have to establish what is not working here because in theory there's just barely enough power supply here to run these. So I can tell you that our imbalance issue that we were seeing here is a direct cause of these the wild fluctuations in capacitance here. So as I'm going, I just caught that. I thought I'd come out here and correct myself. You don't you don't get to ignore problems like this or when I say something when I make a statement like, "Oh, it's a two driving and then whatever you figure out it's not exactly that I don't get to ignore that I have to point that out I have to bring that to everybody's attention in, in you know the sake of transparency I have no problem making mistakes on camera none it's the fun part about being me just be me I'll lift each one of these caps up and then we're gonna test its capacitance value on each one of them it doesn't matter I'm gonna pull them all off replace them with metal clads so this thing has the best chance of success it is kind of nice. It's got a built-in set of, you know, redundant replacement transistors per se. But I've also got to remove all of these. Oh, and why I've got you all here, we have to do the, is it Teflon or is it not Teflon test? <laughs> I totally forgot about this. Um, once again, because I know you all don't watch every single one of my videos. Um, I've covered this in multiple, 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 multiple videos before. Um, X-Force towards the end was using very substandard components and it came all the way down to the wire. Like he would use, like I'm pretty sure this is Teflon here, we're gonna find out here in a second. But he had this marine grade, it might not be Teflon, it's awfully soft. Um, he had this uh, marine grade wire that felt like Teflon, looks like Teflon, smells like, tastes like Teflon, but when you put heat to it, it melts, which is bad. If this thing gets a couple hundred degrees worth of soak on it, we've got to rely on the high temperature rating of the PTFE wire that's in here to keep everything in balance in the circuit. So if it's got non-Teflon wire on the input, this all, all of these have to be rewrapped. If the chokes aren't Teflon, they all have to be rewrapped just simply because they're interacting with the RF in a voltage controlled environment. And if the metal and the ferrites gets too hot or the tubes get too hot, we have a chance of having the wire get cut or split or have a problem, then we have a short. Um, on the end of short things, it could just blow the transistors up. On the high end of things, it could cost a fire. So let's uh, we'll call it the, the Teflon test. Did it deform? Did it melt? No, it did not. This is, I'll be damned, Teflon. I'll wipe it right off, it's clean. Not Teflon. Can't wipe that off, we just melted that. So not Teflon. So all I gotta do is rewrap the chokes, which is not a bad thing. That's easy, easy work. I've had them come in here where I've had to replace all the wire which is basically rebuilt the whole box. So, okay, now we know where we stand. Check these caps, rewrap all of these, change all of these caps throughout here. Um, power wire upgrades, and then we'll run it and we'll see if we still have our heating issue in this one resistor. Okay, just continuing on here. The pain gets even better. I'm gonna to have to replace every single cap in this amplifier. Ooh, not these, they're 180s. Oh my God. Hey, 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 we got one cap in here I don't have to replace. So every single one of these capacitors I've got to replace, they're all the wrong value. These should be 120s by the way, not 100s. And uh, this should be a thousand. And I haven't bothered to look yet. Let's do it together, you and me, me and you. Oh, these are 150s, but they're too small of a KV. Gotta to go to metal clad. 
Yay! <laughs> ah. Guess who's back, back, back? Tell your friends, friends, friends. Baby eyes back, back, back. Okay, listen. What we're looking at is the ass end of this amplifier. I just got off the phone with the customer. Let's let's go down in here and look. So we're in luck. We definitely don't have to replace the heatsink, it's wide enough. But what I really want to show you is this here. Towards the end, I, we don't know if he was in rehab or he had a heart attack or what the deal was, we don't know. But somebody else for a short interim, um, I can't remember the guy's name, was kind of running everything and we couldn't get, nobody could get a hold of Ireland. But we noticed there were some changes that took place in the construction and one of them was this piece of phenolic that we can see here this let me offset the light you see over there on the right hand side right in here there's that kind of greenish looking board that's what the copper phenolic boards look like on the back side um, I pointed out a long time ago on a galaxy far far away that the way the heat sink is situated it sits back from the back of the cabinet like that far so you have a one inch wide uh, one inch tall and three inch long deep hole that air can run right out of well air is like water it's going to follow the path of least resistance always and so i get these boxes in here i've never really quite liked this design even though it's worked it's been out there for decades i'm not a big fan of it um, just because, primarily because of the way the air is routed, it's not very efficient. And then, um, well, now that you guys got this visual representation, let me lift you up and I'll show you what I mean. Let me move the camera. So here's our exhaust vent port on the back, the back of the deck. And um, here's the obstacle course the air has to make it around to get into the air pathways of the heat sink fins. So we allow this uh, three-fourths of an inch gap here at the front for us to have our air wrap around and then get channeled and go down the heat sink and exhaust out the back of the cabinet. Well, let's think about this for a minute. We're, pa we're putting a lot of resistance in the pathway of the air. So we have our air come in over here on this end of the cabinet, which we're already starting into the process of removing power supplies. And then I'll take my hydraulic punch and we're gonna punch out these grills that are here in the back. Too restrictive of airflow. So we're adding restriction and then we're gonna put power supplies just like that. That space is just barely big enough for my hand. There's no place for the air to ramp up in speed. So we're actually asking the air to come right in and hit a brick wall. And then wrap around the power supplies and kind of float around the cabinet. And then we're gonna ask it to dance another obstacle course. We're gonna ask it to dance the obstacle course of the wire loom in the front of this, this box. Look at all the shit that is in the way of the air making its path across the heat sink. We've got all the coaxes, all the wires, all the control, everything. This is all resistance. This, all these wires, you know, equal air resistance, restriction of air flow. Not a big fan of that. I mean, I, I gotta give credit where credit's due. This is a slightly better version cabinet than what was made for a lot of years. Um, for a lot of years, the whole back of this thing was open. They had six fans in the lid with the iron core supplies and they just moved a ton of air on a cabinet. So I came along and I said, hey, let's think about this for a minute, boys and girls. And I would go and I'd block off all of these vents across here. On some of them, I'd take a subdivider and go down the middle of the deck and I'd make it so that the fan, the heat sinks, and the, uh, the transformers, and the, the bridge rectifiers, and the caps over here, 
had their own separate air chamber and they had exhaust out of this end of the cabinet. They had two 120 millimeter fans pushing air on them because the bridge rectifiers were getting so hot because they weren't getting any airflow. They put the bridge rectifiers right in between the transformers and they weren't getting any air. They just, they, they couldn't cool themselves. They get hot from doing their job and they couldn't cool themselves. But then we had the amp showing up and the whole board down the middle of the deck was like a dark sooted brown. And it would be from them getting so hot, the transistors getting so hot from no airflow. So we started blocking them off and forcing the air to go across the heat sinks. I mean, in an ideal world, ideal world, we'd have our, our heat sink that ran this way. Okay. When you have your heat sink orientated in this fashion, let me get another visual aid. Let me just grab a, a hunk of stock here. See, right now, this is the way our, our heat sink's orientated, okay? Look at how the transistors are mounted. Now transpose this down to just these couple fins. These fins right here, the width of my finger, is what do most of the actual mechanical work of dissipation of heat. Yes, the whole heat sink does come into play, but first the heat has to wick through the bed of the heat sink to do that. These are the ones that are gonna get the hottest, okay? In an ideal world, if we were using this cabinet, and it doesn't make any logical sense because it, it wouldn't fit on anybody's shelf or table, but in an ideal world, instead of putting all the pressure on just the center, center line of heatsink fin, we'd take and we'd mount the heatsink like this. And then another one right next to it. And what that allows us to do is we take the transistors, instead of having them orientated like this, now we're orientating them this way. So each transistor gets its own set of couple of fins underneath it to do the job, instead of power stacking all the heat sink down the center. And then, <clears throat> and then there was more. And then what that allows us to have, I am, Jack's screaming sense of wanting to know why my camera isn't focusing the way I want it to. And then, focus, you bastard, there we go. You can make the heat sink run shorter so the air doesn't have to go as far and there's not as much restriction and have it vent out the side. And you could increase the amount of vent space which would increase your air flow and then we could shorten the board here. We'd slide, slide the splitter over. Slide the, I mean, you wouldn't even have to split the combiner over. But you could move this, this, the splitter over and you would have more air input space. More surface area for the air to move by. Or it's kind of like this direction, we're limiting it down to a straw but that's the best that we've got for the cabinet design. So we have to go with what we got, right? Well, BBI, how much would it cost to do that? Man, I'd have to punch hole in the lid, punch hole down the side of the deck, have to pull the heat sink out, then we'd have to remount the heat sink, go in this direction, we have to drill, pump, pump. It's a lot of freaking work. But if you do it from inception to birth, it's a little bit better design. Now, what's the purpose of doing it like this? ease of construction and cost. Just saying. Just saying. For a little bit less performance. Just a little bit less. Not, not a major amount, just a little bit less. So <clears throat> now that we're all armed with the same level of knowledge and thinking somewhat on the same page, this guy has elected to get the full money, full meal, deal, full frontal, um, we're going to punch these out. Um, we're going to block these off. We're going to change out all these PP transistors. And I'm going to send them back to them. I don't want them. I don't need them for anything. So we're going to pull them out. So here you go. Here's your transistors. We're going to replace them with a common known denominator, which is a 1608. Um, he asked me what the advantages of going to the C's would be. And I said just a few hundred more watts. Um, not enough to get all that excited about. Um, here's the shit part of the deal. Is he sent this amp off as one thing and got back another. That was happening, believe it or not. This is not the only case of this I've heard. 
Um, that was happening often. This thing went off and it was a two by 10 and it didn't have a fan in the lid. When he got it back, and it only had one fan in it. When he got it back, it had two fans in the back, another fan in the lid, and it was a straight 10 pill. <laughs> I think he got somebody else's amplifier. That's what I told him. I said, dude, that, that, that happened. That, that is actually something that unfortunately happened quite often. This would be about the fifth or sixth time I got told the story where something went out the door and when it came back it was something completely different. So it is what it is. Um, he has opted to leave it a straight 10 pill. So first things first. Oh, and then, yeah. Uh, then we're gonna go and we're gonna do power supply check. So first we're gonna punch this out because this is the, gonna be the most work, physical work, is get rid of these restrictors. I mean, I swear to Christ, if he would have used just a little bit bigger hole or a little bit smaller hole, I mean, he hit the magic butter zone to where the air is going to drag just on the right holes and cut it. This looks so good. And this is such, this is one of these ideas that you have and you roll it around in your head and you're like, man, that's going to work freaking awesome. But then it's one of the deals that after you go and you do it and you actually test it, you're like, oh, it turns out not to be so hot, right? This is super restrictive. And like I've demonstrated, if we go with a little bit smaller hole or a little bit bigger hole, yes, there's a YouTube video out there running around, don't ask me to go find it, where I sat here one time and I drilled all of these out just to be a, a smidge bigger. And just the size of the diameter of the hole made like double the air amount of movement that was able to go through the, the damn thing. It is what it is. Punch this out, do power supplies, and then we got to do a complete rebuild over here. It's all your fault. You guys got me talking so much, I totally forgot the whole point of the beginning of this video. What I was trying to demonstrate to you all, and my initial point was, is this has the right width heat sink, the right length of heat sink, and the airflow through the heat sink is set up properly. It's got the big wide fins, which adds for more velocity, more air volume, but less amount of surface area for the heat sink. So it's a give and a take. Remember, we're forcing this thing to drink through a straw. The whole point was to point out to you that the heat sink is the right width, because like I said, I've had them show up here and they've only got this much heat sink underneath them. That's only like this long, <laughs> okay? Um, this has the right width, you're good. The heat sink is good. I, that is a huge concern with a lot of guys that own amps like this. So, okay, I gotta move on. This is my most favorite tool and my least favorite tool. Every time I touch this damn thing, my finger hurts. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Let's do this and not chop our finger off. Still can't feel anything in the end of that finger. It, I'll never get the feeling back. I'm not the way I was when I was born. this tool and I hate it. I don't know if you guys have all seen that video where I chopped the end of my finger off with this tool, but it happened working with some stainless steel because I'm an idiot, yo. Okay. bird all the way around the edges so there's no sharp edges hanging up for anybody's fingers or anything to get caught on so <clears throat> this will dramatically improve the volume of air we went from this style of grill to this style of grill uh, just because the way the pattern is 
it makes it so every once in a while we get a little couple extra dots on the outside. Um, I was mounting these on the outside of the case and that increased distance helped a little bit in the velocity but the problem was when I go to ship these things the fans were getting smashed. Outside edge, back corner, pressure on the outside of the cabinet. It just did, I ended up having to replace a couple of these so I'm back to being inside. But that will help dramatically. Each one of these fans produces 35 to 40 CFM a piece, plus the one on the lid, which is 35 to 40 CFMs also. Now that it's not having to breathe through a straw to get the air in, now it's just got to force the air out through the straw through the back of the cabinet. So, okay, well, I've got these out. Um, time to drop positive leads and start testing these. And seeing what we got for reference voltages coming off these two supplies. And hopefully they're still good. If they are, I'll put them back. If not, I'm going to replace, repair. Then I got to do the same thing with the front ones. Okay, so what we got here is the power lead that comes from the distribution bar over here that ties all these other supplies together. Let's look at the DC voltage coming out of this supply 7.43, 5.55. Meanwhile, all the other supplies are putting out 16 volts. Now let me grab this second lead. And let's just touch it to this back supply and we'll watch what happens over here on the voltmeter. Drops to 15.2. We'll just slide that up in that hole. We're going to leave it there for a second. Aha! Uh -huh. This looked familiar. That's our arresting test voltage that we had initially at the very beginning. We'll pull that power supply out of line, 15.2. We'll pull this power supply out of line, 16.5. So I would beg to argue that these two supplies have had an internal failure of some kind, or their reference control lines haven't been installed properly for the other power supplies to match in their voltages. And that's the reason our voltage is dipping so hard, is because we're minus 60 amps worth of supply. So not only are these two supplies dragging down the rest of the power supply for the box, but when these the amplifier actually goes and loads, this portion of the power supply is having to overcome the drag load voltage of these, plus support this. going down. Okay, I gotta disassemble these supplies. Well, this is simple enough to figure out. So they go in and they remove this diode and then they bridge over this fuse. And those are your two primary, or not diode, this is a capacitor, pardon me. These are your two primary safety interlocks for overvolting, and well not overvolt, but over amping the supply for the most part. There's an over amp crowbar protection circuit over here, but nine times out of 10, this fuse will pop first, hopefully, in theory. They use the wrong reference diode for ground control over here on our voltage. There's a, they use a variable potentiometer here. There's a 10 ohm resistor that's here, and then they take a diode and you couple that back and then you can use that as isolation and that also acts as a, uh, like a shunt load and you can vary your your ground reference through a set of resistors. Well, apparently these two power supplies are an afterthought and we can tell that because of the wire and the way that they're connected over here in the cabinet. They use a different value diode. So all the other power supplies have got a different value of a diode in them so they trim the voltage based on the other supplies. <coughs> Excuse me. Whew. I need a drink of water. It's kind of clear to me now what's happened. They dialed up the voltage on the other supplies, fixed it, like 16 and a half volts, and then they pulled these off the pile 
and tied them in with the other supplies and never bothered to check to see what it did to the voltage. <laughs> Anyhow, easy fix. We can fix this real fast. This will be simple. Just took a few minutes to take it apart and have to look at it. Okay, so repaired both of these. And then I had went ahead and I put the variable voltage control for these on its own potentiometer. And check it out. So we're at 16 volts. I set our max at 17.78. So we're going to set this back at 16. So the idea is if we set it 16 under load, it'll drop down to 15, 14 something. Because without these two supplies dragging down the power, come on, can't get close enough for the girls to go with. Okay, without these other units attached to these units, these, this portion of the power supply was putting out to 18 volts, which is technically not too high for HG2879s, but it's a little bit too close to freaking being dangerous. So, so now instead of idling at seven and five volts, we're idling at 13. Oh, too much. So our max voltage here is 22.9, which is the high end of the MOSFET control unit. But you don't want to let it sit there for too long. It'll eventually cause problems, I've been told. I don't know. I've never tried to run anything that high off these supplies. So... <clears throat> Back this puppy on down. tight. Okay, now everybody's talking roughly the same language now. It was much easier to go about just putting two variable potentiometers and trimming them to be the same voltage versus going and having to completely disassemble all of these and change the diodes or guess at what diode I can put into here, these two units. So what we've done here is this is our common ground. This is our common ground here. This one goes back to the chassis. This is the ground that actually attaches to this power supply. It's too short for me to be able to have it out here where I can work on it. Then I paralleled the two supplies for the common positive. And we're floating up to 16.3. I'm talking about splitting pubes here. Cool. Let's double verify that we're not floating over here. Good enough. I mean, good enough. So, simple, but just time consuming. So, did our fans, got our power supply right now. I can go back over here and I can fix the amp section. So, let me get this all reassembled, hooked back up, and we'll test it real quick. And then we'll play with the amp section. 16.6, which is close enough for me. And we're just gonna leave it right there for now. I gotta be done dicking with the power supply. So we're just gonna let this sit here and soak for a minute on the power supply. And why it's doing that, 
that come around, we're gonna talk about all of this over here. So, as I've covered in many, many, many videos at this point about the RFP PP100 or RFT PP100. There is no viable replacement for this transistor. Now the customer has opted that he wants to have all of these replaced with HG1608s underneath the auspices or the idea, the belief, the desire that that part's gonna stay in production for a while so he'll be able to obtain replacement components. He wants to leave it as a 10 pill, so we're gonna abandon this, this two pill section in place and we're gonna rebuild these sections. We're gonna replace them with 16 DO8s. All of these PP100s are gonna come out. I'm gonna put them in a bag, the ones that don't break as they come out, if, if any of them do break, because it does happen. And he'll have these as a backup set of transistors just in case, let's say in seven or eight years, they're no longer manufacturing the 16D08. We hope, we hope that they still are. But <clears throat> at least then he'll have some what of replacement components. Now I'm here to tell you that the RFP, the RF parts transistor 17XH is a direct cross for the 1608. I don't know if I've ever made that public or not, but all the RF parts transistors that are the 20, the HG RF parts, uh, 2879s, the 17X, yeah, the 17XHs are all a direct cross for the 1608. I don't know why, I mean, Merritt and Steve both told me that. I don't know why they just didn't put RF parts, 2879, 16 d Makes no sense to me, but I do have a couple boxes with the RF parts transistors out there floating around, so that's another viable replacement, and they do intermix. So now back to this here, I wanted to sit here and watch the power supply, and we've come up one tenth of one volt. I'm going to call this fixed. It's like the amp that won't stop giving. So I'm out here and I'm working away and I get all the transistors lifted. And each time I do a pill change, I don't show it on video because it's like really monotonous and boring. I come out here and I clean the pill pockets before I go and I put the new transistors in. That allows us to do a couple different things. Um, That allows us to do a couple different things. The first thing it does is allows us to get all the old cream out of it, the old thermal compound, which is an unknown variable to me, and all thermal compounds react differently in how they do their job. But it also allows me the opportunity to inspect the holes. The holes are really important to me anyhow. There's something that I wanna pay a little bit of attention to. 99% of the time, if you have one transistor that keeps blowing in the same spot, not man, I've taken it to five different technicians and they all change the transistor over and over and over again. Look, it's not any of these satellite components, transformer, capacitors, all any of that other shit. It's that the hole that the transistor gets bolted down with has burbled up from the screw is lifted up just a little bit from the screw from you screwing into the heatsink and it's not letting the transistor sit perfectly flat the transistors are really sensitive to what's underneath them it's their only ability to get rid of heat other than maybe well maybe evaporating a little bit of heat from the top through the ceramic lid and we all know the ceramics is nothing another form of glass not the greatest conductor of heat versus the metal surface that's directly underneath the transistor. And there's no physical bond between the transistor wafer and the metal surface. There's a little piece of ceramic that sits between the two that keeps the two insulated. So they're capitalizing on the fact that the ceramic will conduct heat 
more efficiently in that one direction, but it's a calculated space. And so the, the foot of it is really important where it attaches to the heat sink. If you have one hole, and let's say just this ear is attached on this, this particular pill pocket, okay, and this one's got a lifted up end, the only place it's making contact is here because the transistor is going to push itself. We'll say this is flat and you've got contact over here. It's going to lift the whole transistor foot up, just, just a smidgen. And that one transistor is constantly going to get hotter and constantly blow up and break down. These holes are really important. That's why after you drill these, if you own a tap like I do, I hate doing heat sink. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. You've got to be very precise and patient and can't get in a hurry. Um, I just don't like doing it. After you drill the hole, you come back and then you have to chamf or countersink or recess drill, however you want to go about phrasing it. Just a little tiny cup. You got to cup that out a little bit so when you do go and thread a screw in, when the screw starts its job, it doesn't peel up a little piece of aluminum and cause any resistance or headspace gapping between the, the foot of the transistor and the heatsink. Now, that being said, as I was cleaning, let's see, where is this other spot? There's two spots that pump, popped out at me real tight. This here, this little bit of a lip here on this, this hole, but this right here, is a little tiny, sorry, this right here is a little tiny piece of solder that has been smushed down by the foot of the transistor. Now guys, we're not using super soft, hyper-engineered, very high quality controlled high dollar components like the Toshibas. Everything that's in that Toshiba, because it was built in the 80s and 90s when we had really high standards of manufacture, you can bet dollar to donut that if you take the foot apart, run it through a ball mill, and then run it through a gas spectrometer, the shit that's in the foot of the transistor that was made in the, the 90s and the one that was made in 1998, 1999 when they quit making them, was the exact same material makeup. The Japanese are kind of specific about that. Well, the 2879 Toshiba transistor foot's a little bit softer. I don't know if any of you guys have ever taken a pair of pliers to a bad set of pills, like just taking a plier and trying to bend the ear of the transistor a little bit. And like, ee, 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 you know, the 2879 Toshiba transistor foot is real soft and it's also thinner than the HG and the PP and the DEI. And there's a bunch of little differences between the foot material makeup. The HG is actually thicker and harder, so it doesn't want to bend or give any at all. Um, like when I first started out, I, I used to get on this rant about um, transistors and the thing that they call hydraulic cupping, where the transistor, if you put too much thermal compound on the transistor, the transistor wouldn't, instead of sitting flat, it would bow. You have a screw here and a screw here, and there would be a big gap in between because the, the transistor was so soft that instead of squishing the thermal compound out of the way, it would grab it and the resistance of the thermal compound would be enough to make the whole transistor only have contact at the ears. So with used transistors, I used to sand them a lot. Probably gonna end up getting lung cancer from that. You're welcome, radio killed you. Yeah, well, I gotta die something. The reason that you gotta make sure your pill pockets are clean today is because the HD transistor is really hard. So there's not gonna be any give in the foot whatsoever. That one little flick of shit could be enough to cause the whole transistor to fail. There it is. So we can get it up on a Q-tip for y'all to look at. Yep, there it is. Let's go to manual focus. Let's see if we can get it. There it is. There it is, on the edge of the Q-tip. That one little spooge of shit could be enough to cause a big enough gap for you to have a potential part failure. It's no joke. So, 
something to keep in mind. I don't feel that that's something that I need to resurface. All right, well, let me keep on cleaning. I got a couple more pill pockets I got to finish out. And um, we'll put the new transistors in it, and then we'll reflow all the solder and make it look all pretty. And we'll start stacking parts up. Well, I guess we'll start here. So here's all the 150s I replaced. All the uh, 100 puff caps are replaced. The 300 puff caps are replaced. These are all our Class C chokes. I'm gonna replace all of our flybacks. We'll come back to that. And then we replaced all of these. Now, once again, I'm gonna say this just in case you didn't catch it. If your amp has these caps in it, you need to send it off and get the caps replaced. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So, Let's go over here. Let's take a quick look through down in here and see what we've got done so far. I'm at the point now where I'm going to go wash it. So these are all 1,000 puff within 1%. These are all 330s that are within 1%. Um, instead of having the 120s out here on the outside edge like what we normally do, um, these were all mounted at a cant across the front. I did that for a while. It ended up getting in the way of the resistors and if you have to do a pill change or whatnot. So down in here, if you can see, let's go to an off angled one. There, that's a little bit better representation. This is the way it was stock here. And so I've moved both the trans most both the capacitors to the center. Those are now 120s instead of the 100s. So <clears throat> to make this technically work properly. We had to put the right parts around it because what was in here was, what would we figure these out to be? These are supposed to be 860 puff. We went to 1000s. The 100s, we changed those to 120s. The 300s, we changed to 330s. And then on the output in the back, we've now got that full of metal clad 150s at a t uh, three, four times the KVA rating. So we never have to worry about those failing. Um, you'll find in the <coughs> one by uh, one by was it two by six and the straight six cabinets that the biggest thing that we have a failure on is this capacitor right here. They get hot, they get super hot, saturated with heat, and then they break down, they devalue. Where the metal clads we've proven over and over and over again, they don't drift, they don't change in rating that much. No matter how hot you get them, and they don't break down. They, they can put up with a lot higher KVA, a lot more pressure electrical pressure. So I'm going to go wash it, um, clean all the solder work up in here, as in take the flux off of it, and clean the whole board because this whole area has got a bunch of little tiny flicks of solder from, you know, when it was manufactured, the first time it blew up, the second time it blew up. I think this has been back three times. And I want to clean and just kind of wash all the flux and all little bits of schmoo off of everything and that'll make this all look like a shiny brand new little silver penny okay we'll do the same thing with the power strip we'll get it all cleaned up and then i'll come back and i'll put the power distribution network back in and then i think we're going to be ready to test what we are going to do at the tail end of the saga is uh, they put the output combiner ring in with jb weld i'm not a big fan of putting epoxy back here or up here. I'd rather do commercial grade hot glue. On well, the commercial grade hot glue holds to the board just as well, if not better. We found that it flexes with the board. So this board flexes a little bit. So in shipping and in transit, and when you're moving it around and picking it up and stuff, what you don't want to have happen is this combiner ring come off and be flopping around in here loose, it can cause all kinds of problems, like all kinds of problems. But <clears throat> to be fair, as they say in letter candy, to be fair, um, we had this resistor in one of our first segments was getting hot 
and that's either from the inconsistency between the 150 puff caps or these worthless piles of shit that were in here attached here so to revalidate and reprove our data um, we're going to replace these resistors but first I want to run it with this little one watt or two watt resistor in its place we'll run it first then when we see it's not heating and not giving us an imbalance then we'll go ahead and we'll replace it with the bigger resistor that way the so-called hater nation or the guys that like to sit around and nitpick until the cows come home which I'm comfortable with that it's still a YouTube video and people sit around and they talk about it like they're in a place of authority or they're actually over here doing the work and they know better or something I don't know it doesn't make any sense to me if they knew better or they were over here doing the work or whatever well let, let me get let me understand this <clears throat> I got enough work to last me right now standing in this room almost a year I'm getting ready to take on a, another year's worth of work and if they knew better or were so enlightened why don't they start their own repair shop that's the question I have always asked myself. They should. There's enough work out here for all of us. Actually, we need about 20 more guys. I mean, honestly. Not talking shit, straight up. If you think that you can be an amplifier technician, get your ass out here. Let's go to work. There's more than enough work for everybody to go around. By far, hands down. So... It is what it is. Anyhow, that appreciate you guys. You, you only make me stronger and better every single day. So it is what it is. I mean, like, where do you think this entire bench setup come from? Do you think I just woke up one day and said, hey, you know what? I'm going to put like $5,000 worth of bird meters on my workbench and build a $5,000 power supply and have, you know, $4,000 worth of radios and buy all the expensive test equipment soldering irons and test tubes and computers and probes and everything because i already know what i'm doing no i didn't this is all built from somebody saying hey you got it wrong like the bird meter i've said this in many videos i started out with a little dozy test center perfectly happy and then somebody came along and said well that's not a real watt meter and for you to be taken seriously you got to buy a bird okay so i bought a bird and bought my first couple you know elements slugs and bought a peak kit and it started with the, the peak kit that's over here this one well you know you know <clears throat> uh you can get in there and you can mess around with that peak kit well we've proven that over and over and over again that that peak kit actually is better than the actual bird peak kit that's in that watt meter and it's only every single time somebody comes along and thinks that they're going to be critical or they're going to try and run me down and show my lack of knowledge i take that as an opportunity to learn and so I listen to them and then I make adjustments and I modify my bench. I only make it better. And by having that philosophy in play, you only have the room to grow. Don't ever say anything negative to them in return. You just take what they have to say and go, oh, okay. And then you go and you make it better. So then the next thing, oh, well, you, you need to have a real bird meter. Okay, so I go out and I buy bird meter number two. This time I go through the effort and I buy an actual bird peak kit that uses want are two nine volt batteries and runs through them five times faster than this one and you don't have a multiplier but the data is exactly the same well you know you know what it is you know how he's getting all those watts and making things look like that it's because it's uh you know his dumbing load and his reflex all messed up okay let's go buy bird meter number three so i've got a permanently in place five watt silicon reverse we'll cascade that by about five thousand different things and this is what you end up with um, like right now, there's a guy out there that's running his, running his mouth about the spectrum analyzer. Okay, no problem. Let's walk over and go, beep, beep, beep. Change my meter so it reads the way he wants to see the data displayed to him. And guess what? Now that loophole is fixed, if there ever was one, which I don't believe there ever was. And we move on and it only makes the workbench as a whole stronger and more reliable and more consistent and less places to have holes in it. So I appreciate the input. Believe me, I'm not shy. And also believe me, I don't care. It's an opportunity to learn and make myself better. And in the same breath, you take the thing that they get excited about and you take it from them and no longer they can get excited about it and then they don't have a bitch anymore. It's a win-win for everybody. 
It's the beautiful part about being humble and not pretending like you know everything. Because guess what? I don't. I don't. I know a lot, and I'm learning more every day, just like the rest of us. Remember, over here at the house of BBI, we did not invent toilet paper, but we are smart enough to use it. Well, at least attempt to use it. Let me go watch the box, put the power wires in it, and let's get on with the show. Okay, here we go. Let's get this over with. Kind of excited to see what this is going to do. So we got all the power wire upgrades in, all the parts in. We're sitting at 16 volts, 16.08. Um, we repaired the on-off switch in the front, by the way. Now, that's really dangerous for us to have the fans wired on the switch. Let me explain to you why. Because you can heat soak this box and then reach over and hit the off switch on it. And there's no chance for this thing to cool down. So the fan that's on the lid, we're going to tie that onto the bus. So the fans will always be on if you flip this switch on. See right now, power supply is on, power supply is off. Down it goes. Talking about over here. It'll go even quicker if I turn the fans on. Amp on, power supply on, power supply off. Okay, so the test that we performed um, day before yesterday. Oh, it's been so busy the last couple days. This should have only taken half a day or a day to get done. Okay, so the test that we performed the other day was we ran it, we put about 50 watts in it from the striker, if memory serves me, from the striker up here, if memory serves me. And we were making about 1200 watts of power, nothing more. So to start off with, we've got a thousand watt slug and peak. Hello, same and same. 1,000 on average, at a And a 5 watt slug in reverse back from the bird 10,000 watt dummy load, at a Okay, now we got all those units of measure established. Let's go ahead and we'll flip the switch to the on position. At a Now we're going to put a lot more dead key out there than what we did when we first tested it. And the reason we can do that is because now our power supply is all repaired. If you can remember in the previous segment, we were key, it would sit at about maybe 14.2 and when we key it would drop down to less than 14 volts and that was with less than a 100 watt carrier. And then we'd modulate and it was dropping down to 13 point whatever. I mean, it was falling flat on its face. Now we're sitting at 15.7. Power supply is doing a whole lot better with the load. So let's go over here, we'll click that up to 2X. And as you guys could see, it was taking it off the scale, just running it plumb off the scale. So let's get in here and let's do some measuring. So 2x is what the, the peak meter is reading in. So full deflected over to the right is 2,000 watts. So you can see in 1350, almost 1400 watts of power. That's good. That makes me happy. What makes me even more happy is this here. So let's get our FLIR out. And if you can remember correctly, we're going to take this picture. That is our combiner ring that we just took a picture of. I'll insert that now in the video. If you remember, our resistor on our port in the back right hand corner was getting really hot. Now we're completely balanced. Hello, audio. Remember, that's with 50 whole watts of drive. And the radio, striker is running on 12 volts, as we can see there in the background. So let's go down here and let's turn this on. And let's let all our supercapacitors charge and get up off the batteries. So now, we're going to get the full brunt of the striker. Hello, audio, hello. Let's turn this back down to 1x. And let's go show you how much our drive increased. Hello, audio. 
Now we're up around 100. So we'll put this back down at 2x. No, that's 5. 2x. Turn the amplifier back on. Hello, audio. Hello, audio. 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. Hello, audio. 1, 2. It's a beautiful thing. So now we're keying 200 watts. Let's raise that on up here. We'll put our day key at about 400. Hello, audio. And going forward. Hello, 16. Some change. Let's go over here. Let's take a look at our power supply. Hello, audio. Hello, audio, one, two. 16.5 or 15.5 that's a tremendous improvement tremendous improvement power supply performance probably amperage consumption we've got perfect balance going on our combiners our input SWR is low I'll show you that here in just a second now we're gonna switch radios real quick we shut the striker off we're going to go back over to the Striker 490, which does like 120 something watts worth of power, 130 something watts worth of power. Hello, there's two grand. But the amp is capable of much more than this. Run our dead key up enough to keep it latched. Hello. So at 25 watts worth of drive has allowed us to get up and off the chart. Okay. So now, once again, we're going to change drive and we're going to kick this up even further. Hold on a second. I got to bring another amplifier into play. Okay, so now we got the bench two pill in play. We've got uh, the 2950 hooked up to the bench two pill. We've got our watt meter down at 1x. Let me show you. Sorry, that was. One of my parents checking in about something. Okay, so right now we've got the watt meter in 1x. So it's showing face value, and we can clearly see the position of the switches. Clearly see the position of the switches. So we're in 1x face value. So we're going to drive this harder than what it suggests on the front of the amplifier. I think the front of the amplifier was a quiet little prayer to the amplifier God saying, please just take it easy and maybe it won't blow up. Hello, too much. Hello, audio. Okay, so right around 200 watts worth of drive is what we're going to put into this. So now we already know at about 125, which is where the, the front of the amplifier, the listing on the front of the amplifier suggests that we run the thing, we're making 2,000 watts. So now we're going to go down to 5,000. So 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, we're never going to see 4,000. Forget about that. Enough lead shorts in the back end of this horse my ass to get it to go that far. Okay. Don't have the day key high enough. We'll day key about 400. Hello. About 21, 22. Hello. 21, 22. Here's the fun bit to look at. Hello. Fifteen point six straight on the money. Fifteen point five straight on the money. I mean, straight on the money. This makes me happy. This took a large portion of yesterday to get this all unmessed up and make it work right where everything is complementing everything else. And to not see that voltage drop, that means winning. So 200 watts max drive. Listen, this is just like your car or your truck. Your car and your truck, in theory, can make like 120 miles an hour down the road. Do we drive 120 miles an hour down the road? No, we don't drive 120 miles an hour down the road. We just don't do it. We do not do it. I'm showing the max potential for this box. Your goal as an operator 
is to put 150 or less in this box, be happy with the 2000 plus ish power that this thing can make, stably, smoothly, cleanly, and enjoy it. Now, now that we've got all this working, and we've demonstrated everything working, guess what we get to do? We get to add bias to it. Why? Because apparently when the Blue Label Company was manufacturing these, they proceeded to tell everybody on the face of the earth that this little switch meant it had sideband in it and their mantra was less for more. Meanwhile, they're selling you a Class C amplifier that if you run it on sideband, it will blow up. Well, this guy wants the jack wagon of all jack wagons of all trades. So we ran it in Class C. We've established that the power supply is fixed and up and running. Now, the only thing I got to do so far from here is I've got to add a yet another relay. That'll be a total of four relays in this box to make it work every single time you key up. I'll add yet another relay. We're going to add some load resistors across the input transformers, and we're going to put bias in it. Well, here we are at the very end. The bias is installed. Everything's done. I mean, there's just so little left that I could actually do to this amp. Um, I mean, seriously, that's... That's completed. All done. So, all our switches, the power supplies are on at the moment. That's the OPP, operate button. Sideband preamp. They're all fully functional. Our BIOS is all installed. Now it's actually set up to actually do sideband. You can talk on it. Not burn your box up. Let's close up our, sar our sarcophagus here, our cabinet. So, the way that I have this set now is that this lid is on. If the power supply is on, the lid fan is on. That allows you to get the box cooled down. It puts a little bit of air in it, and most of it's going to weep out through the fans in the back. But if we listen real close, We'll turn the fans in the back on and turn the amp and operate. Listen to what happens. This slows down from the back pressure. So we got our air coming in from the back, our two fans in the back, pulling air in, pushing it in as hard as it can. This fan on top, you got a good amount of airflow coming out of the back of the cabinet. So everything's the same. We're in 5X over here in the watt meter. We're going to drive it with the same amount of power. Hello, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Let's go ahead and let's zoom in over here. It picked up a little bit of power with the bias engaged. And we're conservatively running it at this point. So what we're after is we want this thing to be just a hair past that 2000 watt mark with about 170 watts driving it, right? It's like 2400, give or take. 111, hello, 1111. Here's what our harmonics look like coming out of the amp. We're set at zero on our reference line. Our second, thirds, all that kind of stuff are way down there at the bottom. 40, 45, 50 dBm down. So it means we don't even need to worry about it. That's from 0 to 238 megahertz. Box is clean. All the problems that were going on with this thing, gone. This thing's going to run forever for you now. Just be easy on it. Listen, it, it's like a car. Your car can do 200 plus miles an hour. Drive around doing 70 and 80, it'll last you a lifetime. So just put like a 120 watt radio in this thing, enjoy 2,000-ish watts, 
give yourself some headroom. Remember, you don't have the best ventilation in this cabinet. You, you just don't. There's nothing that we can do to modify it short of putting really, 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 really loud fans in it. There's really not a lot that we can do. This thing is the best as it's ever going to be. And I think I've thoroughly demonstrated what you're getting into. That note, I'm done. I'm going to enjoy the rest of my weekend. Maybe come out here on Sunday and edit this video together. I'm done. Guys, I appreciate you tuning in. I appreciate you checking out what we were working on here today. I got a couple more Dave made base boxes I got to work on, but uh, there's going to be a little hiccup. You're probably not going to see another video out of me until probably next week. Um, well, you are going to see one out of me probably tomorrow, to be honest with you, so we can talk about the rules of what's going to happen here in this next month. And then I'm going to take me a little break from the YouTube thing here. I've got to finish this 3CX3000, and then I've got to finish the Big Red Pig. That's got to happen here in the next couple weeks. So on that note, I appreciate every single one of you guys. Big shout out to Singlet, Siglent, Excess Power, Bird, and Coaxial Dynamics. And if I can ever help you with anything or you got a question on anything, don't hesitate to give me a call. I'll do the best I can to answer your questions. Thanks, gentlemen. Appreciate every single one of you guys. Like I said, welcome and thank you. I'll see you. Click, click.